Welcome to The Robbie Rose Show. I am the host, Robbie Rowland. I want to personally thank you for tuning in to today's episode with Alan Jager. Now let's hear a little sound bite from Alan himself. Do you want to throw two to three miles an hour harder and feel good all year long and get stronger toward the end of the season? And if they say yes, then you introduce them to long toss and you start teaching them yourself. Yeah, what's going on, guys? Um, it's your boy, Robbie Rowland, here on another episode of The Robbie Rose Show. Episode 58, to be exact. And not just episode 58, but 58.1, um, Alan Jager. We're going to do a three parter. The first ever Robbie Rose Show three-part episode. Launch it for a whole week. Um, first episode, this one you're listening to, is going to be Aaron Monday, part two, Wednesday, part three, Friday. Now, that is important because of the following. Alan and I will be doing a major contest starting on Monday. So if you're listening to this episode on Monday, you're in luck I guess you're even in luck if you're listening on Tuesday or Wednesday. So anyways, the first contest that we are going to be airing, we're going to be doing two contests. First contest, going to be done on Twitter. Going to be done on Twitter. The contest will air Monday, and there's going to be a couple different things that you got to do to qualify. You got to go to Twitter. You got to follow Jager Sports. It's at Jager Sports. I will link all of these uh, things into the show notes of this episode. Um, so you can just scroll down on your platform and you'll see it. But again, Monday, Twitter, follow Jager sports, follow me at Robbie row underscore one, two, and then retweet the tweet that this link will be in. I'll make sure to specify on the Twitter platform exactly what tweet it's going to be that you need to retweet. But just know that the tweet it is, it's going to be a link at the bottom with the podcast episode. So that specific tweet is going to be the one that you're going to retweet. I'm going to throw up a video on my Twitter on Sunday around 8 Eastern time, giving you all the you know, d- deadlines, uh, basically going over every single thing that you need to do to make sure that you can qualify for this. Now, I know you're wondering, what are we getting, Right. What, what, what's out there? So Alan has been nice enough to be able to give the winner of the contest a complete competitor package, which is worth 129 bucks, guys. A complete competitor package, but that's not it. He's also going to throw in some elite J-bands or the upgraded J-bands um, from, the other, from the old ones. So like I said, Monday. The air, the air date of this specific episode, February 4th, Jager Sports and I will be doing a contest on Twitter. Twitter. The platform Twitter. If you don't have Twitter, make an account and enter this contest. The only way you can win is if you have a Twitter and you do the following. Follow me, follow Jager Sports, and then retweet the specific link that this podcast episode will be in. So it's going to be a tweet that says... Uh, I don't know exactly what it'll say yet, but it'll say, you know, Robbie Rose Show episode 58.1, you know, go listen to the link um, and also retweet this link to qualify to win the contest. Again, I will be doing a video on Sunday night, February 3rd, 8 Eastern. I'll post that on my Twitter and it'll give you all the, the qualifications to enter the contest. So... All right. Well, hope you guys enjoy this podcast. Again, this is part one of uh, episode 58 with Alan Jager. Um, we're going to dive in a little bit to his background, uh, long toss, routines, J-bands, in-season, off-season stuff. Just great. Altogether, just great content. So um, you guys are definitely going to enjoy this particular episode with Alan Jager. At this time, a quick shout out to a sponsor of The Robbie Rowe Show, Pocket Radar. Um, for those of you who either are a current player, a baseball player that is, or a father or a mother of a, of a player, 
uh, as you guys know, it's a it's a high demand in, in the game today when, when in regards to velocity. And the way to get the most out of our ability, in my personal opinion, is to constantly track where our speeds are. And I'm not just talking for pitchers. You know, outfielders' arm strength is huge. Infielders' arm strength is huge. And also a huge thing in today's game as well, talking about data analytics, is exit velocity, right? So I think it's of high importance to demand a lot out of yourself when you do pick up a baseball or you pick up a bat. And I think pocket radar is the perfect tool for that. Is you know, It's a little tiny pocket like a phone, phone-shaped radar gun. And I've used it for the last five years now, and I carry it around in my backpack. And um, it's just a great tool to have. Uh, but what I can do for you so I can save you 10% if you want to purchase a Pocket Radar gun today. You go to PocketRadar.com, type in discount code Robbie 10 That's Robbie 10 at checkout, R-O-B-B-Y-1-0. All right, guys. Appreciate you guys for listening. Now let's get to the show. Hope you enjoy part one of a three-part episode with Alan Jager. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Robbie Rowe Show you're listening to episode 58 with my man, Alan Jager. Alan, how are we doing today, man? Robin, what's up, man? I'm doing great. I am pumped to be on your show, man. Oh, I appreciate you, dude. Um, again, like I know I said it three or four times now, but I do really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on the show. And, and again, like alluding to that, like, I appreciate everything you've done personally for, for myself and my career too. You've been a very big help, uh, for me. Um, been a huge influence within the baseball community, man. So I definitely appreciate what you're doing and what you've been doing for, uh, for a long time now. I, I kind of want to start from the beginning, uh, if that's okay with you. I mean, I obviously I kind of know, I know your backstory, uh, just, uh, just briefly, but for the audience, man, would you mind taking us through kind of the backstory, like maybe, uh, some playing career, um, and where that kind of all started. Yeah. And I appreciate the kind of words, man. Um, yeah, in a nutshell, um, my last stop, uh, was at Cal State Northridge. I was a junior there as a pitcher. Um, you know, I had played a couple years at Pierce junior college and what have you. And, um, I went through a real difficult time, um, mentally, which ironically is what really got me into teaching, uh, being quote unquote a coach is, I went through a tough time mentally, and I got so interested in the mental game that I, I got hyper-focused on that. Um, when I did graduate from school, I did start doing you know private lessons, and I was a pitching coach for three years at a junior college, LA Mission Junior College here in, the, in, in LA. Um, but it was kind of interesting that I started really in the mental game. I wrote a mental game book in the early 90s, and... Um, but as a pitching coach, I had always been in love with throwing and long toss. And so, in fact, my current business partner, Joe Batcher, was my long toss partner at Cal State Northridge back in the, uh, like, 1986. And what's cool is, you know, he was a five foot nine outfielder um, who had just a cannon. And he actually made it to the big leagues. And one of the reasons why he got his foot in the door was because of his arm. Uh, that got people's attention right away. Not believe me, he could hit, he could feel, he could do a lot of things. Um, but as he talks about many, many times over the years in our clinics, you know, when you when you get a chance to throw in front of a scout, you have a few few opportunities to stand out. And as we both know, you know, one of them is your arm. Totally. Um, so, so anyway, you know, that was sort of the combination of the mental games as a, as a player getting interested, um, always loving long toss. As I said, my current business partner was, I was a pitcher, he was an outfielder, but we, we found each other because you know how it works, man. You, you know, you need to find someone that wants to throw as far or as long as you do. And uh, we were a perfect match. And uh, yeah, at some point after I stopped coaching, um, you know, at, at the junior college level, I just, I just decided to open up my own practice where I integrated mental game, um, throwing, pitching, long toss. Um, and then, I, and then soon after I studied yoga. So I kind of created like programs based on that. And that's, you know, really the beginning. That's how I first started. Cool, man. And dude, like, I mean, I'm going to say it firsthand. That's probably the hardest thing about being a long toss guy is finding someone else to long toss with, especially if you're doing a foul pole to foul pole, uh, three to four times a week. I know. I mean, 
me personally in my career. Um, it's it's definitely tough. I do want to get your your opinion on this. This is a hot topic, man. Like, what do you advise your guys um, to do during a season when they're on a staff that uh, doesn't necessarily have a lot of guys on there that are willing to stretch it out? Well, the first thing I would suggest is they let one of their good buddies know on the team, um, do you want to throw two or three miles an hour harder and feel good all year long and get stronger toward the end of the season? And if they say yes, then you introduce them to long toss and you start teaching them yourself um, and become a coach. Because for the players that don't know about this, it's just sad because uh, there's a whole world waiting for you from a health, endurance, strength, recovery period, feel, athleticism. We can go on and on about the benefits of long toss, as you obviously know. Mm-hmm. So uh, the first thing is, is just try to let one of your good buddies on the team know, like, hey, just trust me on this. Stay with me. Work, you know, uh, follow my lead. Uh, number two is, as you know, there's, if there's a world, there's a way. There's a few options. One is, is that you get the... You know, sometimes catchers like to throw further in position players. Um, you can always get the, you know, you can put your athletic trainer and strength and conditioning coach back to back. Um, you can have them, you know, with a fungo where they, you throw the ball into them, they, they fungo it out to you. Uh, worst case scenario, which actually works, um, is you take a bucket of balls. Yep. And I'm sure you've done it many times. Many you times. Start out, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just start out by, and you can get a lot of work done by throwing into a net. Even though you're only at about 50 or 60 feet, you can start moving the angle up. So you can sort of get the first 150, 180 feet without even using the bucket yet to save time. But at some point, you just throw the balls one direction, then you go pick them up. And it may not take, you know, a whole lot of extra time. But look, if I'm a 330-foot guy, and I need to stretch my arm on a 330-foot today based on what kind of cycle I'm in or what I pitched the night before or I'm pitching tomorrow. If today's a 330-foot day, I will tell you right now, I'll give it 4 a.m. if I have to. Yeah. I will get 330 feet in that day. I will get pull-downs in if I need to pull down. It's really not hard at all. It's, maybe it's not quite as fun as throwing with somebody, but it's really not that hard to get in. And like I said at the beginning, at the end of the day, you just want to get one of your good buddies that you spend time with that trusts you and just say, look, just trust me because I'm going to help your career out. And I know my, my partner, Jim Batcher, was a position player, so he he played professionally for like 15 years, so he had the same problem too. And it's amazing how many players that would long toss with him and they'd go, man, my arm just got a lot better. Oh, jeez, you know? yeah. It's I have one quick side story of that. I, I saw Eric Burns once, like, somewhere in Arizona not that long ago. And, and I go back with Eric, like, back to his UCLA days. So, mm-hmm. And he told me, not that he didn't take his arm seriously, but, um, but he signed with Seattle toward the end of his career. And for whatever reason, each year came up to him and said, you are throwing with me. And Burns is like, okay. <laughs> and Eric, Eric rediscovered, like, Toward the end of his career, he might have been 35 or whatever, he rediscovered how electric and strong and great his arm could be just because he started throwing, having to throw each throw every day. Mm. He was stretching it out and long tossing and throwing maybe for 30 minutes or, you know. So it's just, it's there for the take. And as you know, a lot of guys, unfortunately, are sort of in this survival mode and they think that they're saving their arm. And as you know, that's like the polar opposite of how the arm is going to grow and get healthy and get stronger. Uh, but unfortunately, because the guys are at the field every day, and I'm not saying there aren't days to go easier or go lighter, but um, I think they've just gone way too far to, to where they just, they're just they just sort of saving their arm, so to speak. And as, and as you know, with your experience, we talked about when he was a relief pitcher, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, you know what that, and that's what it is, right? Is like I think uh, a lot of those guys kind of get in that predicament where, they see, um, you know, the the outside looking in. They go, okay, why would I, why would I throw the ball as far as I can before the lights come on, or why would I waste my quote unquote bullets before the lights come on? And I mean, I'll be the first one to admit, man, like I wasn't necessarily brainwashed by a couple organizations, but I kind of got that notion that, you know, obviously, if you're in an organization that kind of wants you to go one way, 
then you all you want to do as a player is please them. So then you kind of shift and mold your uh, you know routine accordingly. Um, but that's kind of the next topic I want to dive into, man, is like developing a routine. Um, obviously, those routines vary for, for starters and relievers. But um, to ask you, like, what is what is the foundation for someone's routine? Obviously, pitchers um, getting into, like, say, a college level or, or professional setting. Well, first of all, personalization. Um, you know, everybody's different. Um, some guys like to pin on this day or that day. Some guys like to go further on this day or that day. So rule number one is, as you said, figure out what your own routine works best for you. I can give some pretty strong suggestions based on 28 years of doing this and asking lots of questions, getting lots of feedback, lots of observation. Um, the bottom line is this. Um, you know, For our program, based on guys that are in just unbelievable shape, and really, really well conditioned and therefore recover really well. Our guys will, will basically need to on their start day. So we'll, we'll kind of tackle starters and maybe we go over relievers. But um, whether it's a five day cycle with pro ball or switch, now it's becoming almost like six days, which yeah. to me is actually a good thing, or seven days in high school and college. You know, the bottom line is this I always start from like, I like to reverse engineer a lot. So I always like to say, okay, how are we going to make sure on your start day you are in peak shape, you know, uh, AKA beast mode, right? Mm. So what I do is I always just sort of start from that as the premise. Well, let's start on your start day. Well, on your start day, you want to make sure that you're able to basically stretch your arm out as far as you can because you're used to doing that. And secondly, if you're used to doing that, um, well, that means that because you're fully opened up and fully stretched out, your arm is going to want to do what it's used to doing. So instead of saving your arm for the game, so to speak, um, our guys, let's say they're 300 foot guys is a simple number. Well, 300, 300 feet to me represents the arm being completely opened up prior to aggressive throwing. So if you're going to throw aggressively that, that day, which of course you are as a starting pitcher, mm-hmm. your arm needs to be fully opened up, not sort of opened up, fully. Now, you don't have to spend as much time maybe coming in on the pull-down phase. That's where I would say you can save your arm a little bit more for the pen in the game. But essentially, start day is a full stretch-out day, a full pull-down day. Um, and again, you can minimize your pull-downs at least to the last 100 feet. But you're off to the races. That's what your arm is used to, and that's what it wants. Day two for me, for most guys, our guys are going to recover really well. They're in great shape. So they're still going to need to go out. I'm cons- I say it could be conservative, 90 to 180 feet. A guy like Zito wanted to stretch it out fully the next day. I think Bauer does the same thing too. Yeah. Um, because they just they want to flush it out. They feel like they need to stretch it out almost max distance again. Now, there's going to be zero linear throwing, zero aggressive throwing, but it's all what I like to call massage throwing. So yep. anyway, in a conservative sort of general population way of doing this, I'd say – you know, 90 to 225 maybe. Uh, again, this is based on at least a, a, a strong high school arm to up to pro ball. So let's just say 90 to, to, to 200 feet. I've, I've said three different numbers. So let's say 90 to 200 feet is sort of like the next day. All uphill stretch throwing. Now day two, for a seven-day cycle, you have the luxury of not needing to pen for two more days. So day two for me might be 250 to 300, all stretching. Now, day three is when you start to max out and get into your pull-downs. Um, I still tell guys to maybe back up the pull-downs a little bit because day four is the bingo day of the week in season for a starter to get in max distance, max pull-downs, and then pen. Mm. So what happens is is that your, your real heavy pen days are sort of day one, your start day three and four, and you can kind of massage those to where you make sure you're, 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 you're happy with your pen day, whether it's day three or four. I would recommend four. Um, day four, by the way, is more, again, of like 180 to 225 to stretch it out. Day six, the day before the start, I, you know, everybody's different. I, I tell you, know, get out and do something, maybe 60 to 90 feet. Um, now, day seven, you're back to your start day. You're back to full distance, pretty much normal pull-downs. And, and the way this works now is, is that you're optimizing your recovery 
and you're optimizing your rebuild on this cycle because you're using your start day, which is the day you're going to get aggressive and you want to be opened up. You're using your start day and then your main pen day and then your start day seven days later. You're using those three key days as your key stretching your arm fully out days. And also those are the days you can get aggressive because you're going to get aggressive on the mountain anyway. And what happens is you fill in the blanks of the other days with listening to your arm. Mm. And like I said, the average guy, you know, who's in really good shape is probably going to need, if he's a 300-foot guy, he's probably going to need 150 to 200 the next day. But if he only goes out to 90, that's fine. But maybe maybe spend 20 minutes at 90 feet or 15 minutes, get some volume. But look, at the end of the day, what really matters is, is use day one, two, and three to set up day four which then sets up day five and six, which ultimately sets up day seven. So that's why I say you reverse engineer. You know where you want to be on day seven. I've got seven days to be there. This is clockwork, man. This is how you get to back to beast mode on day seven to where you're actually getting stronger through the season rather than depleting yourself. So that's a, it's a basic model. Our, our Europe throwing manual breaks this down and, as always, as you know with me, I'm all about individuality and everybody's different. So, you know, like I said, someone may go out 300 plus the day after their start and then go back to 150 the second day and then start to kind of prep for their day four. And then real briefly, the, the day five, well, we can hit that one fast. It's the same thing. Instead of 147, it's 135. Right. So the day of your start is a max distance pull down. You know, day two, again, you're looking at 90 to 200 feet. Uh, day three is, again, probably guys are pushing close to their max distance with no, with no pull-downs. And then now the third day from the start is full distance, full pull-down, and then pen. Day four is optional, and then day five, you're back to your start. Yeah. You know and, and you know what's funny, man? And I think it, it, this gets misinterpreted as well, uh, especially, I mean, I'm going to speak for, for pro ball. Um I don't really know the college scene all too well, but I know a lot of the individuals in pro ball, um, they see the long toss regimen. They see like, you know, for example, my starting routine, obviously I'm a, uh, to them, I long toss every day, right? If it's past 200 feet, apparently it's long toss. Um, but the, the thing that I really noticed is you talked about the recovery of your arm. And I think it's a mis people misinterpret it the routine because they're like, man, that guy's doing a lot, right? He's doing so much throughout his five day or six day routine, whatever you want to call it. Um, but then I think I said it before we, we started the show was that you start learning more and more about your arm, more and more about your body and uh, the adaptation of, of your body in that regard. And I think people uh, lose sight on how much they can grow uh, their arm throughout the course of a season, right? And I think a lot of people get in a pattern of just like, well, I'm trying to survive. And um, I remember when I talked to you specifically in 2015, a lot of the times, man, it was like you, you instilled this um, idea in my head that you know, I can continue to progress. I can continue to grow. Like if I was, if I threw 95, one outing, like why couldn't I throw 96 or 97, like the next two or three outings. And I think that was a testament to what I was doing in between my outings or even before my outings. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a misinterpretation of uh, the routine, the long toss, the, the, the constant, doing of a lot of things and uh, not realizing how good that actually is for, for one's body and, uh, and one's arm. Again, I'm, I'm only going to speak, you know, for me personally, I can't really talk again. It's, it's an individuality thing like you talked about, but um, I want to, uh, I want to dive now kind of into obviously like you can't look at a bullpen in today's game without seeing some J bands. And I don't, I don't even specifically know what the story is, how that really started. Um, so shoot, man, like where, when did that even come about? Like, what was the idea behind the start of the J bands? Uh, you know, take, t take it home for us, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, number one, um, it happened organically, which is just amazing. I was a, a pitching coach. I was doing lessons. Um, I was coaching at Mission Junior College. Um, ironically, um, our head guy at Mission Junior College brought some bands in one day. So that was the first time I had seen them. Um, they're actually brown and 
it's hard to explain. They, they kind of look like J bands, but uh, it was such a different thing for me. And it wasn't until maybe a year or two later I met Perry Husband, who everybody knows, you know, for Effective Velocity, and you know, he's done a lot of work in the baseball field, and um, you know, he's just a great resource and super, super bright guy. And he actually had back then he called them isolators, and I think part of it was he he, he was a hitting guy, and he had these he had tubing in general. That went around your uh, with with cuffs that went around your ankles, right. maybe to help from floor striding. And I'm not sure. Oh, I know. I asked about this the other day because I I, I didn't want to source it. He had an arm injury mm -hmm. of some kind in pro ball, I believe. And he started doing bands, and he got addicted to them. As you know, if you start doing bands, it's like you you, you fall in love with bands fast because yeah. they just it's, they just make you feel so good and. He had a revelation, even though he was a position player. Um, he's a smart, smart guy, and he's in tune with his body. And man, it, 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 that had a bingo with him. So um, he just, this is, you know, way pre internet. This is, we're talking 1993 or 4, maybe. Wow. And he, he just started selling them more word of mouth and just people he knew. And, uh, and I just started having him make them for me, like, five at a time for my private lessons and uh, you know five turned into ten and ten turned into twenty and he actually got to a point after a few years because he did all of this by hand he ordered all the parts and he had this, this lab back in his home where he he put these things together on this machine and um, he got to a point where he started getting tired of making them yeah <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> but I mean back then you know it, Tired of making it might have went instead of like uh, might have been instead of you know ten a month it might have been thirty a month or fifty a month um, and so I, I you know if I were to be just as truthful as possible I just really believe that it sounds like a great promo but you know the, the bands sell themselves J, J bands for me have become a byproduct of people that are into training and learning, which this whole generation now is all about information, education, development, training. So it's everywhere, as you know. So I just think the word of mouth is so powerful because, uh, as you know, if someone introduced you to a new anything and the next day you felt great or you were thrown three miles an hour harder or you, or you recovered better, it could be anything. It could be someone that just gives you advice on, you know, I don't know, how to navigate Amazon better, and you're like, man, he told me that trick, and now it's like, <laughs> we all need that. <laughs> yeah, but you're like, man, I'm like, I'm saving 10, 15 minutes a day on a computer because of that trick. Yeah, no one needs to tell you. You're like, that was a game changer. And I think what's happened is, is that bands in general, I, I love this word, but they're so visceral to the body, the effect. No one has to tell you, like, technically, yeah, do it right, but. You know, it's not like a three-week deal. It's usually instantaneous the first time you do band work. And so they, I think they've just they've, they've sold themselves because the product itself, band, bands themselves, are a game changer is the bottom line. And the, the feeling to you is so noticeable. <laughs> yep. And so I would just say, man, it's just been a background. And look, I've been in this baseball community for 28 years now. Um, you know, my, my circle of friends and coaches and people like yourself, you know, fortunately has, has just grown significantly from doing this so long. And also I think that, um, I think that there's a lot more behind the bands than just the product, you know, people call our office, whether they talk to Jim or China or not my nephews there, or, or they hit us up on Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, there's people there that have decades in cases of myself and my partner and, and even China now of, of experience to where you're getting great insight into how to implement this properly and how it goes with let's say long toss. So I guess that would be like a way of just putting a bow on the whole idea of how they came to be. Um, and then I think the internet obviously was huge for many reasons. I think one, it helped for word of mouth and uh, and two, now, I mean, look, social media, I mean, I mean, last year, like, at the, 
in, in Omaha, you just see so many teams that are using them. Oh, there are so many cool shots. In, oh, I remember Kyle Peterson at some point was talking about how the position players at Oregon State were using them, and, and they had this really cool video that before the game just lined up on the fence, man, like 20 guys. Yep. So I think that kind of stuff obviously has been so helpful um, from just a public relations point of view or, or, or just organic marketing again. You know, it's nothing that we've really got out of our way too much. But mm -hmm. um, So at the end of the day, man, what, what do they say? That the proof is in the pudding, and I just think that the product itself is it, it's so it's so beneficial and helpful. Yeah. And, and it's, again, it's just a visceral kind of effect. Yeah, no doubt, man. And I think you, you touched on it a little bit there, but that, where I stand with it too is I feel like it's all part of it, right? You talk about the J bands, you talk about the long toss, you talk about the pull downs. I think it's just the total package that, um, you know, the more and more you, you buy into it, uh, the more and more you get out, uh, you know, as far as the, the growth in your arm and, and the recovery protocols and, you know, again, I know I'm saying it a lot, but speaking from, from personal experience and then also speaking with like my past teammates, you know, obviously seeing like the routines and stuff that I was doing and kind of diving into it. And then they, it's funny how they go, dang, these like, I feel so good when I do these bands. I, I feel like when I touch a ball, like I could already be out to 200 feet, you know, and it's, 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 it's just neat, man. Like hearing that over and over again, I do want to, uh, I, I kind of want to stay on the topic of the bands, but I, I want to delve into like a post throw routine. Cause I know again, it's individualism. Everyone's got to have their thing. Um, for me specifically, you know, starter or reliever, wherever I'm at in my career, I actually utilize the bands for post and, or, or sorry, pre and post. Um, now do you have like a specific type of routine that you uh, encourage guys to do after they're done throwing? We do. And, and nowadays again, Everything's so advanced. There's so so much great information out there. You can obviously go to someone like uh, you know Eric Cressy, or I know Driveline has a lot of stuff for recovery. Um, and so at the end of the day, for me, what we've done is we've just said, look, here's the bare minimum. We feel very very confident about um, the, the few exercises that are externally rotate, you know, the external rotation movements per se. So we've always told players, look especially if you get on a mound in any shape or form, whether it's a pen or obviously a game situation, we say, look, the bare minimum is do external rotation and hip height, do external rotation, elevated shoulder height, do the reverse throwing motions, which for me is probably the most important one to do, even the reverse flies. So anything, of course, that's going external in the external direction is critical because you just – tax the arm, and, and the majority of it, of course, is you've gone forward, so it's the back of the shoulder that you really want to, you know, attend to, so to speak. So for us, that might take you five or six minutes. You know, nowadays, I think, you know, driveline, they have uh, some reverse throws as well, um, but I would, I'm good at punting stuff to people that that's more in their lane. Um, again, I would say research someone like, you know, Eric Cressy, you can go on to Twitter nowadays, there's just so many people, yeah. you know, Randy Sullivan and Casey Fist, there's so many people out there that you could resource and just ask the questions and get a good program. I'm sure Eric's got plenty of stuff up there too, um, but I can say this, um, I know it sounds funny, but I pitched in Sunday leagues for 15, 20 years, <laughs> and I didn't get a chance to throw much during the week. Um, I probably did some bands and got one at least one good throw in. I did my band work after I threw, and, and sometimes, you know, I had games I threw a lot of pitches. But I always felt like anything externally rotated, especially that reverse throwing motion, was clutch. And so I would just say for listeners out there, just know you can take the J-bands. On, on our exercise sheet, it's actually exercises um, 5, 7, 9, and 10. So that's reverse flies. Hip height, external rotation, shoulder height, external rotation, and the last one is reverse throwing. If you just did 25 reps or so, just like you did pre-throwing, maybe you do it with a little bit less tension, so it's a little lighter. But man, if you just did that, it's going to be in old school terms, like running, you know, 12 or 14 pulls. Um, 
you know, it, I mean, just psychologically, I don't want to get into the whole running, the running thing, but you know what I meant, metaphorically. Yeah, every, everyone just went, what? <laughs> yeah. But it's like, I, I use that analogy because it's old school, but really, in my mind, the running was more about flushing and blood flow and, and removing stuff and, and recovery. Um, without getting into the whole debate, even though it sounds like there may not be as much of a debate about long distance running for, for pitchers or what have you, but <laughs> at the end of the day, it is such a great safeguard. And I tell players to do it immediately, meaning get some water, unless you're a two way guy. Once you're done, get some water, get your post throwing stuff done right away so you can start the recovery process right away. Yeah, um, definitely, man. Um, I uh, was sticking on the subject of routines. Now, I know where I stand with this. Do you, do, do you encourage a different routine for, for, say, one of your guys compared to being an in-season routine or an off-season routine? I'm, I'm assuming uh, there, you, know, you have two different kind of setups there. Obviously, in the off-season, you're not competing um, every fifth or seventh day. So does that routine, how does that vary? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think the routine, the way I broke it down in our manual is this way. You have your off-season build, which is basically four to five weeks away from the mound if you're a pitcher. Obviously, if you're a position player, you just roll with it. But as a pitcher, let's say it takes four to five weeks to get into you know optimal throwing shape from a conditioning, endurance, and recovery point of view. Well, now you obviously have to build up your pitch count on the mound between pens and live VP and eventually innings in a game. So it's sort of like you start with the off-season program, which is listening to your arm and progressively ramping up. Once you get to that five-week period or when you know you're ready to get on a mound, then you start to slowly, it like starts to morph into the end season that we just talked about, the five or seven day cycle. So you kind of start to integrate the mound stuff, but you're still really on your off-season schedule. It's not until your pitch count starts to increase that you need more recovery, you need more time to recover and build up. So it does start to morph into the end season, but I would just say they're totally different in a way, but yet once the season starts, your maintenance still is a brother of your off-season program. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's just... As you know, you have to start manipulating the in-between mound days because once you're in season, unless you're a relief pitcher, where you and I have talked about this, where you can maintain a lot of your off-season mentality. It doesn't change that much. Um, for starter, as you know, it starts to morph into, I really only have two and a half to three days, maybe three really good long toss days where I get to pull down. Um, the other four to five days, and the reason I said that is because if you start your seventh day, it's like eight days total. Every five days is really like six full days. Um, so, again, it's the off-season more so to the in-season, but, um, but I guess it, it, it is two kind of different animals. The relief pitchers, right. and you and I talk about this, that's where I get, I just get so frustrated by watching, especially if you're a one-inning guy, and everybody's a winning guy except for a, a very few amount of guys might go too, and then you have your long guy. But I'm so frustrated because you spent three months getting into unbelievable shape. Now you pitch one inning, which is 15 pitches. It's nothing to your arm. You're going to recover like a champ the next day. You can literally maintain your off-season cycle. You can stay in unbelievable shape. Um, yeah, if you go back to back days and maybe you're only out to 120 and you're not doing anything at all because you shouldn't pitch the third day anyway. But as you know, I have found through guys I've worked with and talked to and asked questions from, um, there's no doubt about it that guys across the board way under throw and under condition as relief pitchers. Uh, in fact, I wrote an article with Adam Revolette, um who's at UAB now and writes uh, as the editor for Inside Pitch Magazine. And we have this topic. And basically, and for anybody out there, if you Google Relief Pitcher Protocols in Inside Pitch Magazine. I'll link that in the show notes, Alan. Um, if you just send me the link or after the show, I can link it in the show notes for people who are interested in reading that. 
Perfect. I'll send you that. I'll send you the JBAT exercise workout too, so everybody knows what exercise you know five, seven, nine, and ten. Perfect. Are. Perfect. And yeah. um, but I love the thing I love about the article is I basically say that look, stretch your arm out pre-game, open it up, but you don't have to close the door. You don't have to shut it down. You can, you don't have to get linear and aggressive. But yes, stretch your arm out and free it up and open it up because you're going to get aggressive. It doesn't matter if it's three hours later or four hours later. You can do bands every half an hour to keep your arm warm. You can play catch every half an hour to keep your arm warm. You can you can ramp up your band work the inning before you know you're going to go in and make sure you, you, your arm stays warm. I, I use the term in the article, incubated. You know, keep your arm incubated. So I think one of the greatest disconnects and, and really misnomers of baseball for relief pitchers is this idea of going out to 90 feet or 120 and saving it for the game. You, you, you're, you're actually regressing your arm and you're, you're actually compounding your relief, sorry, you're compounding your recovery period potential issues because now instead of the arm thriving as you go into the season and lengthening the season, your arm starts getting less condition, what I like to call basically, I hate to call it, but it's basically shorter and tighter movements. Um, you're a 300 foot guy, man. You're, you're going to need to be near that 300 foot range probably four to five days a week. And look, even if you're about the 200 feet, stretch it out. Open your arm up. Get your arm freed up so that later on it's, it can be explosive and not feel like it's breaking through like scar tissue. <laughs> you know, it's an extreme, extreme way of looking at it. Appropriate. That's sort of how I look at it. When I see a guy go out to 90 feet on a line, I basically look at it like his arm was in a cast prior to the game. And now, four hours later in some cases, in, in 61 degree weather or in New York, 39 degree weather in April, you're going to like get a phone call, get up, and you're going to get on a mound and shock your arm? Hmm. Doesn't make any sense. Get your arm totally stretched out. You don't have to do anything aggressive. Just open it up, stretch it out, keep it warm for the next three or four hours. One thing I've talked to some clubs about, which is cool, and they're adjusting, I think the Dodgers went to this last year, um, is starting to get their guys to do their throwing close to the game, like close to 7 o'clock, as opposed to at 2.30, yep. so you're sitting around for 7 hours until 9.30, and man, you know this as well as anybody, so throw closer to the game, number one, as a, as a relief pitcher, two, stretch your arm out, whatever feels right, and stretch it out, um, three, every 30 minutes or so, just play some catch, do some band work, keep the arm incubated. Ramp it up prior to the inning, you think you're going to go in. My goodness, you're going to be so hot when you get on the mound. You're going to have life on the ball without max effort. And here's the key you're going to feel so good the next day that a lot of people don't understand that your recovery period is such a major factor in how do you get healthy and stronger throughout the season, as you know. All right, guys, that'll do it for part one of a three part episode between Alan Jager and myself. Episode 58.1. Thank you guys for listening. Don't forget that Twitter giveaway is starting February 4th. February 4th. It's a Monday. It's when this episode that you just listened to will air. So, again, go to the link in the show notes if you're confused about the details or if you want to go to my Twitter page at Robbie Row underscore one two, which will also be linked in the show notes. You'll see somewhere on there a video um, that I'm going to put up Sunday night at 8 Eastern that will clarify everything that you need to know to, to be able to enter the contest. So that'll be Monday. Hopefully a lot of people listen to this on a Monday because then it'll just make more sense. But that the contest will air for about three days. So we'll go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, where there's going to be another episode release. On the Wednesday episode, I'll make sure to, to re- remind people, but the contest will conclude on Thursday night. So Thursday night, so you guys have about three days. Well, I guess that's three and a half, four days. Anyways, just know that the contest will conclude on Thursday. All right, guys. 
Um, with that being said, thank you guys for listening. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Be a subscriber to the Robbie Rowe Show podcast. So I'll be lo- releasing three episodes per week, bringing you guys some great, great guests, great content coming your guys' way. And if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and leave me a review on whatever platform you're listening to it on. That'd be cool. That goes a long way. Thanks, guys, for listening. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of y'all's day. Look forward to hearing from you. And uh, best of luck in the contest. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Peace.